Good morning. My name is Claire. I'm going to be reading today's text, which is found in Esther chapter 4, beginning in verse 11. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that for any man or woman who comes to the king to the inner court who is not summoned, he has but one law, that he be put to death unless the king holds out to him the golden scepter so that he may live. And I have not been summoned to come to the king for these 30 days. They related Esther's words to Mordecai. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not imagine that you and the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maidens also will fast in the same way, and thus I will go into the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and did just as Esther had commanded him. This is the word of the Lord. All right. Well, I want to say, um, I don't know what's going on with the audio, uh, but we're going to continue to preach the, the, the important things are not audio or lights or video, but ultimately... Uh, that we gather to worship the Lord and to hear from His Word. And so we're going to do that uh, regardless of how well amplification works today. Uh, if you're here today, uh, you're, you're visiting, you're a guest, I want to say welcome to you. Uh, we started a series last week, and it's called God of My Story. Uh, we heard from a man named Antonio, who's a pastor of a church that this church helps support in uh, Guanare, Venezuela. Uh, they're in the midst of a really difficult time for their church, uh, and yet God is at work. They're trusting Him uh, in all that they're, they're doing. And so it's just extraordinary to see how God can work in the lives of people who make themselves available to God. Now, here, here's kind of where we are today. Today I want to talk to you more specifically, not about somebody else's story or about what God might do in somebody else's life, because we, we believe it, don't we? Man, God could use him and God could use her. The question is, is do we believe that God could use me? And so today, we're going to be looking at the the Old Testament book of Esther, and we're going to see more specifically how God works in our story and in our individual lives. So if you have your your Bibles and you want to turn, just go ahead and go to Esther chapter 4. It's going to be up on the screens. Normally when I preach, I'm going to have a very specific text of Scripture, and I'm going to read that and draw all my points from it. Today, I'm going to do a rather difficult thing, and I'm going to attempt to summarize the entire book of Esther for you, okay? So I'm going to narrate that the best that I can, but I want you to see uh, kind of the bigger picture of the story of Esther, all right? So here goes. Esther was a young woman who was born in exile. Uh, Years before the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar had invaded Jerusalem. They carried uh, the Jewish people out of Jerusalem, away from their hometown, and kind of their center center of political uh, power, if you will. So Esther is born to a family who's living in exile in a place that they didn't know. Not only that, just shortly after her birth, her parents uh, had both died. And so she was exiled, and then she was orphaned. Uh, She was actually cared for by her closest relative, a man named Mordecai, who was her cousin. He took her in to raise her. He loved her. He cared for her. Now, Esther is introduced in the story after um, we hear about King Xerxes. Now, Xerxes was a powerful king whose citadel was in a city called Susa. If you want to know how big his kingdom was, it extended from India to Ethiopia. So, massive kingdom. And Xerxes was really proud of his wealth and of his power. And so uh, in beginning in in Esther chapter 1, you're going to see that King Xerxes threw a banquet to exhibit his wealth and power. And this banquet was, was so opulent. It was so extraordinary, if you will, that it lasted for six months. Now, um, uh, you, you might have someone in your family that like when it's their birthday, that's like my birthday week or maybe my birthday month, right? Uh, this King Xerxes, he was celebrating himself for six months. Opulent banquet, uh, all of the trappings. And at the end of the banquet, I guess he'd run out of things to um, display just his, his glory, if you will. And he decides that his last tool that he's kept back is actually his wife. 
Her name was Vashti, and she was beautiful. And he calls for Vashti to come before the people to exhibit her beauty before everyone so they would think, man, Xerxes must be quite a guy if he's got Vashti. And yet Vashti, his queen, refused to come. And for a king who's bent on displaying his power to rebuff his demands was not a good thing. And so some scholars debate as to whether Vashti was just banished from the kingdom or if she was killed on the spot. But ultimately, she is removed as queen, and the king Xerxes begins looking for another one who could be a suitable queen. So throughout his entire kingdom, Xerxes sends out his prefects, his princes, whoever it would be, to gather the most beautiful virgins in all of the kingdom. From India to Ethiopia, all of these women are gathered and they brought uh, to the king's palace where they're going to receive a year's worth of beauty treatments. Then they are going to take their turns going into the king. They would sleep with him and try to please him. And whoever did the best was ultimately going to be chosen as queen. So Esther This young woman who was born in exile, who had been orphaned, is now forcibly taken from the one place that she called home, the one uh, person in her life who she could call family. She's now removed from her home and finds herself a servant of the king in his palace. Now Mordecai loved Esther. He began to spend time at the palace gates. This man, Mordecai, who was Esther's cousin, he began to spend his time at the palace gates, and he grew to some prominence, most scholars would say. Um, One day, while he's hanging out at the palace gate, he overhears a plot to kill King Xerxes. A couple of guys were plotting to assassinate him, and Mordecai reports this, obviously, to the king. The plot is thwarted. The king is saved, and the king is so delighted that he hasn't written down down in the king's book of chronicles. This happened in my reign. You know, on this day, uh, they tried to assassinate me, and I thwarted their plans. Now, in the meantime, you have Esther, who is receiving these beauty treatments. She's been given cosmetics and fragrances and spices. She's been treated in every way that she could possibly make someone more beautiful or appealing, and her night to go into the king comes. And on that night, as Esther, and by the way, I don't think she desired to do this. I think if she could have run away, she would have. But she ultimately goes into the king and she finds favor in his eyes. And she is made queen of the kingdom. Now, you shouldn't think that this queen... Uh, ship, if you will, comes with any power. It doesn't come with a lot of, uh, 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 of sway or influence on, on what the country did. As a matter of fact, as we read before, um, if she even wanted to come before the queen, she could o- or the king, she could only come when summoned, or else if she came unsummoned, she could be put to death. So it's a difficult position that she finds herself in. She's now made queen. They celebrate a banquet in her honor, but she's essentially living out her life in the king's palace. Now I need to introduce you another character. It was a man by the name of Haman. Haman was extraordinarily wealthy and powerful in the kingdom of King Xerxes. He was his number two man. Uh, He was very wealthy. He was given lots and lots of power. And he was so influential and so highly regarded within the kingdom that whenever Haman would leave the palace and go outside, people would bow and pay homage to Haman. But there was a problem. Mordecai, the cousin of Esther, who hung out at the palace gates, he was a Jew. He believed there is one true God who is worthy of our worship and bowing down to, and that is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Yahweh, the God that we serve, right? So when Haman came to Mordecai, Mordecai refused to bow down. And it made Haman so angry that Haman decided he was going to slaughter not only, uh, not only Mordecai, but all every single Jew living within the entire kingdom of Xerxes. And so he goes to Xerxes rather slyly, by the way. He goes to Xerxes and said, did you know that there is a group of people living within the bounds of your kingdom who don't obey your laws? Hey, you're so powerful. Remember, you're the king. When, when your wife didn't obey you, you had her banished or put to death. Like, you're this king. There's a group of people living within your kingdom that don't obey your laws. Now, here's what I want to do for you. I want to take care of those people for you. As a matter of fact, if you let me do this, I will put 10,000 talents of silver into the royal treasury. Now, a king who is drunk with power, 
and drunk on money. Those are the two things he cares about. He sees that this will consolidate his power and enrich him financially. He doesn't even bother to ask who. Instead, he gives Haman his signet ring, and an edict is issued across the entire kingdom that all of the Jews should be wiped out and annihilated. You can take all of their stuff. You can plunder them. Like Whoever participates, just go get what they got. They can be wiped out. Now, when news of this reached Mordecai's ears, and really all of the Jews, they began weeping and mourning and fasting. And Mordecai sends word to Esther, and he says, You've got to do something. And you've got to intervene. This is the text that we read. It's the exchange between Mordecai and Esther. In, in Esther chapter 4, verse 11, Mordecai says, You've got to say something. And here was Esther's response. She says, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that for any man or woman who comes to the king in the inner courtyard who is not summoned, he has only one law, so that he be put to death. Unless the king holds out to him the golden scepter so that he may live. And I have not been summoned to come to the king for these 30 days. Haman, I don't know, or I'm sorry, Mordecai, I don't know who you're talking to. You know, I don't know if you realize how it works in the kingdom. I'm a queen, but I have no power. If I go into the king, I could be put to death. Here's what I want to do, Mordecai. I'd rather just lay low. Mordecai, I'm hanging out in the king's palace. I don't know if you remember, but I was born into exile, and then I was orphaned, and then I was, you know, I got to have you as my family, but then I was forcibly removed from my family, and this is the first stable and safe and secure place I've ever lived. Um, Mordecai, I'm not sure I'm going to go to the king, because if I do, it might cost me my life. So Mordecai sends word back to Esther in the palace. In verse 11, Mordecai told him to reply to Esther, Do not imagine that you and the king's palace can escape any more than all of the other Jews. This was a fact that to this point Esther had kept hidden. She hadn't made it known that she was Jewish. I guess she's hoping that maybe if she keeps it quiet enough, maybe all the other Jews would be annihilated, but maybe not her. And yet, Mordecai, don't imagine that you and the king's palace can escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, liberation and rescue will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether or not you have attained royalty for such a time as this. So Esther, she asked all of the Jewish people to fast on her behalf. She decides that she's going to step up on behalf of the people. She's going to go to the king and plead her case. And so uh, she does. She goes into the king's inner court and he sees her. And rather than deciding to put her to death, he extends his golden scepter to her. And he says, Esther, what can I do for you? You're my queen. I'll give you up to half my kingdom. And she says, well, um, I want to have a banquet tomorrow night, as a matter of fact. I want to throw a banquet in your honor. And I, I want it to be me, you, and Haman. King says, okay. The next night, there is a banquet. It's Queen Esther, King Xerxes, and Haman, his, the second in the kingdom, Haman. And they're at this banquet, and the king says, okay, Esther, what can I do for you? Like, what, what are you, what's your request up to half my kingdom? What can I do for you? And she says, well, um, I'm not prepared to ask it yet. Would you come to another banquet tomorrow night? And you wonder, why two banquets? You're going to see in just a minute. Because when Haman left the first banquet, he's feeling pretty good about himself. I mean, he just got invited to a banquet with the king and the queen and him only. Um, He's in the inner circle. He's extremely important. He's feeling good about himself. But as he leaves the palace and goes through the palace gates, you know who he saw? That obstinate Mordecai who refused to bow down to him. There had been an edict issued that all the Jews were to be annihilated at a certain date. But here is Mordecai. Even though his death is certain, it's already been decreed by the king, Mordecai is still defying Haman. And it makes him so angry. He goes home and he begins to tell his friends and his family about the insolence of this man named Mordecai. And his friends say, you should erect a gallows 75 feet tall. And when you go back to the banquet tomorrow, when you go back to the king, you should ask for permission to have Haman hanged in the sight of everyone so they will know that you don't defy the powerful and the mighty Haman, right? So Haman does just that. He has the gallows erected 
And the next morning, he's going back to the king, and he's going to request that he might have this Mordecai put to death. But that night, the king had a dream. Actually, the king couldn't have a dream. He was awake. He couldn't go to sleep at all. He was tossing and turning on his bed. He's wanting to go to sleep. And I'm not sure if he thought that the records of his kingdom were boring, uh, that they might help him sleep, or if he just wanted to be entertained by the stories of his own glory. But he has one of his assistants, one of his attendants of the king. He has him bring the king's book of Chronicles and begin to read to him, to entertain him throughout the night. And in the midst of that reading, the attendant just happens to come upon the specific section in the specific book which recorded the work of Mordecai, who had saved the king from the evil plot when the men were going to assassinate him. And the king asked the question to his attendant. He says, what's been done for this man Mordecai, who saved me from this evil plot? Like, I need to honor him. And the attendant says, nothing's been done. About that time, the dawn is breaking, and here comes the evil Haman into the presence of the king to ask that he could hang Mordecai on the gallows. The king is looking for someone to honor, and Haman, who's just been to the banquet with just the queen and the king, he probably thinks this is about him. And so as Haman enters the court of the king, he says, the king asks him the question, what should be done for the man the king wishes to honor? Well, the puffed up Haman, he's like, this is me, right? He's talking about me. And he says to the king, I think you should put a royal turban on his head, the royal robes around his body. You should put him on a royal horse, and you should parade him through the city streets shouting, this is what's done for those who choose to honor the king. And the king says, you know what, Haman? That's a great idea. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go get Mordecai. And I want you to put a royal turban on his head and a royal robe around his shoulders. Place him on a royal horse and parade him through the streets shouting, this is what's done for those who honor the king. I must have infuriated Haman. But that's exactly what happened. Throughout the city of Susa, Mordecai was paraded around as the king's hero. That night, Haman comes back to the second banquet with Esther. The king asked the question of Esther once again. Esther, what is your request? Up to half my kingdom, what would you have me do for you? And Esther says to the king, Would you rescue me and my people from the evil man who wants to destroy us? Would you rescue me and my people from this guy who's bent on our destruction and the king who was previously so enamored with his own power and enriching his own wealth that he didn't even ask who it was that Haman wanted to annihilate? He says, who is this person that would wish to harm you and your people? And Esther says, it's that man. It's Haman. And the king became enraged. He realizes that he's been tricked he realizes that Haman had played him and he storms out of the room and Haman, knowing that his time is likely short, he rushes over to the couch where the queen was sitting and begins to plead for his life. Esther, you could save me. Esther, would you rescue me? Esther, I'll give you lots of money too, maybe. The king storms back in the room and he finds Haman on the couch with his wife and he's seen all that he needs to see. And he orders, well, there's an attendant in the room. He orders that Haman be executed. And there's a tenant in the room who says, hey, I don't know if you know this, king, but Haman just built a gallows 75 feet tall. Maybe you should hang him there. And Haman was executed on his own gallows. The king's edict that he had decreed against the Jewish people, which included Esther, by the way, it couldn't be circumvented. It couldn't be undone. But the king instead uh, issues a decree that says the Jewish people, they can gather together, they can fight for each other, they can, you know, annihilate whoever would wish to come against them. And so the Jewish people are able to protect themselves. The, The royal guard and soldiers wouldn't participate in their annihilation. And ultimately, all of the Jews are saved. Like the Jewish people are rescued because of the the boldness of Esther and the confidence of Mordecai. Mordecai is given Haman's position in the kingdom. He's second in command. And the people of God are given rest once again. Now, 
I told you this story because I believe that there are things that we can learn from the biblical book of Esther. There are things that we would need to know about ourselves in particular that God would have us understand about our own stories as we look at the story of Esther. So the first thing that I would want you to see in this story is that, and it's true of Esther and it's true of us, God, number one, God is at work even when we can't see it. Can you imagine how this looked from Esther's perspective, born into exile? She was orphaned. Then she's forcibly taken from her home and the one place that she knows to be safe. Can you imagine what it felt like to be forced to go into the king to sleep with a man or face death? Brutal circumstances. But here's the thing. Esther's name in Hebrew, it means hidden. And many scholars would tell you that the book of Esther is ultimately about the hidden work of God. And we could see it's the hidden work of God in our lives that oftentimes when we can't see how God is working, we can't see what God is doing. We can trust that God is at work even when we can't see it. You want to know a unique fact about the book of Esther? The name of God isn't mentioned even a single time in the book. Nowhere. He's not referenced in any way. But it's ultimately a book about the hidden work of God. That God is at work even when we can't see it. Now, here's the thing. If you would have been there when the Israelites were led out of Egypt, right? And they, they come to the sea and the waters have been parted and they're marching through on dry land, you would have said, God is at work among these people. Or if you could have been a witness when David slew Goliath and, you know, the, the, the tiny young boy kills the, the huge giant, you would have said, God is at work here. But as you look at your own life, or as you survey the life of Esther, you might find it hard to see exactly how God was at work. If, if you began reading the story from beginning to end, if you, you know, began to take in the details, you would say, God, how could you allow this? How could you allow this exile? How could you allow this poor girl to be orphaned? How could you allow her to be taken from her home and ultimately raped by a king? And yet God is at work even when we can't see it. One of the things that I want you to see today, and it's true about Esther and it's true about your life, is that God is just as much at work in the mundane moments as he is in those big miraculous events in our life. The things that you do day after day after day, God is just as much at work in those moments as he is in the miraculous. Mark, Mark Dever is a, a pastor um, in, in up north, and he notes this, um, that the book of Esther is filled with small but crucial events that if any one of them hadn't happened, um, we can't see how God would have worked the redemption of the people. So, so just a few of these events that you might think were insignificant but were very, very significant. Um, Esther just happened to be born in exile. She just happened to be born extremely beautiful. Esther just happened to be favored by the king above every other woman that was brought in. Mordecai just happened to overhear the plot to assassinate the king, and it just happened to be recorded in his book of Chronicles, right? Now, Xerxes just happened to find himself unable to sleep all night, and he just happened to ask that his attendant would read that specific book and that specific section that describes the very specific actions of Mordecai where he helped to save the king. But it continues even from there. Haman just happened to be in the king's court when the king was seeking a way to honor Mordecai, right? And he just happened to be on the couch when the king came back in in his anger. Haman just happened to have erected a gallows 75 feet tall. And he just happened to be hanged there because an attendant informed the king of what he had done. Now, it is a book that is filled with small but significant things and all of which God was at work in to accomplish his purposes. It's not a book of chance, and your life is not a life of chance. You have been born when you were born, into the family that you were born into, in the place that you were born, in this day and age that you were born into, on purpose. God is at work in your story, both through the big events and even those mundane moments that you might be tempted to discount. Tim Keller notes about this section. He says, 
that God's silence, and we don't hear his name spoken in this entire book, God's silence does not equal God's absence. His hiddenness in this story was not his abandonment. As a matter of fact, what we see in this book is God's powerful work behind the scenes to accomplish his purposes. Listen, I don't know what your moments look like. Maybe for you, as you look back over the story of your life, it's a, it's a life filled with pain and difficult moments, the struggles, and you wonder, how could, you know, this person sin against me, and how could God use this hurt and this pain? And I just want you to know that God is work, at work in the midst of your story, whether you see it or not. He's at work through your tragedies and through your triumphs, and He is working all things the Scriptures would tell us for our good and for His glory. So I want to encourage you today, if you're not hearing God, if he seems like he's not present, and don't believe for a second that he's not absent. If he seems hidden in your life, don't believe for a second that he's not at work, because he is working in you and through you to accomplish his purposes. Number two thing we can see from the story of Esther, our past mistakes don't derail God's plans. I'm going to be honest with you. If I was writing this story about how I was going to like redeem an entire group of people, you know, from, from certain annihilation, I probably wouldn't have picked Esther. I mean, way back when, when this occurred thousands of years ago, Esther was a woman, not really a position of power, right? But more importantly, she wasn't all that faithful as a woman. You, you remember the story of uh, Daniel? and of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they too were carried off into exile. And they too served in the court of a foreign king. You remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel? When it came time to eat the king's foods and to enjoy his provisions, you know what they did? They trusted God instead. They said, well, I'm not going to defile myself. I'm a good Jew. I'm not going to defile myself with foreign foods that have been offered to foreign God. I'm not, not going to do that. And God sustained them anyway. Do you remember when the, the king, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he decreed that anyone who didn't bow down to his statue, statue would be thrown into the fiery furnace? And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they trusted God and refused to bow down to a foreign god. And even though they were thrown into that furnace, there was a fourth one in there and God delivered them from the whole thing. Or Daniel, who refused to, to stop praying to God, was thrown into the lion's den and was preserved. And if I'm writing the story, I'm using a guy like that who was faithful in the midst of difficulty, who trusted God in the midst of his really trying circumstances. To be honest with you, Esther didn't do any of those things. When Esther was brought into the king's palace, you know what she did? She ate the food. She so assimilated with the foreign king's culture that no one had any idea that she was a Jew. As a matter of fact, when it came time to express her faith, she wanted to hide it. When it came time to go speak to the king, she went in willingly. When it came time to marry a man who didn't believe in God, he wasn't a, a good Jew, she married him. And even in the moment in which she could go to the king and possibly save her people, Esther was thinking about herself. Mordecai has to remind her, hey, think about your people. I know that you might feel safe here in the palace, but your people are going to be killed if you don't do something. And yet, God chose to use Esther. And it reveals to us that our past mistakes don't derail God's plans. Esther had failed in many ways. She had a pretty ugly past, if you will. And yet God chose her for such a time as this to serve as a part of the process of delivering his people. I don't know what your story is. I don't know what your past contains. I don't know what's been going on in your life. But here's what I believe about you. I believe that God wants to continue to use you for his purposes. That your past mistakes don't derail God's plans. There's this really pervasive lie that's present. I've heard it in, in this church, in this city. I think it's probably in the South. 
And it's this lie that says that God is going to save and bless and use those people who live good, moral, and upright lives. If you'll just get your junk together before God, man, he's going to save you, and he's going to bless you, he's going to enrich your life. Man, God's going to do great things through you. If you'll just kind of keep it on the straight and narrow, then God will use you. And yet the story of Esther demonstrates that that's simply not true. As a matter of fact, if you read throughout the Bible, it is, it is like littered with people who blew it in big time ways and were ultimately used by God. That lie, that if you'll live a good, moral, upright life, kind of keep it together, then you'll be used by God, um, it's a lie from the pit of hell. Because none of us have lived good, moral, and upright lives. Every one of us has sinned and falls short of the glory of God. Every one of us battles against sin. Tim Keller, I found this quote, says, The gospel is the good news that God persistently and continuously, continuously gives his grace to people that don't ask for it, that don't deserve it, and don't fully appreciate it even after they receive it. Esther is a beautiful picture of God working through an imperfect individual to accomplish his perfect purposes. I want to say this to you today. God hasn't given up on you. He's not done with your life. There is still hope that you can participate in the work of God in redeeming his people in our day. Which leads us to point number three here. And that's the point that God is inviting us to trust him with our lives. Can you imagine how hard this must have been for Esther? She's in the safety of the palace. I mean, y'all, she lived a hard life. She'd been through a lot of things. And maybe she thought that the palace was actually kind of the payoff for all that she'd been through. The palace was God's blessing on her life because she'd suffered so much. Maybe she thought the palace was God's plan for her. She could sit there in the relative safety and security and comfort of a king's palace surrounded by armies and walls and things that could keep her safe. And yet it was God's plan for her to risk the safety of the palace to participate in the redemption of his people. And y'all, we are people who have been given much by God. We are people who are in a high position for, for us to live in America today. We are the wealthiest people to ever have lived in any place in the history of the entire world. And our temptation would be just like that of Esther's, to think that this is the payoff for living a good life before God, that this is really God's will for us, that we just remain in our palaces, if you will. We just continue to redecorate our homes every six months, right? We're going to remodel next year. We're going to get new new things. We're going to live a new life. We're going to surround ourselves with all of these comforts. But listen, the palaces that we live in are not God's plan for us. They are God's plan for redeeming his people. Esther was in the palace for such a time as this, and she risked it all that she might participate in the redemption of her people. Y'all, God is inviting us to participate in his redeeming work in this world. Listen, it's not us. It's not the work that we do. We're simply participating with God in the work that he has already planned to do. Listen, here's the gospel. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, stepped down out of heaven, and he lived a perfect, sinless life only to be despised and rejected by men, falsely accused and convicted before the courts. He was placed on a cross, the nails driven through his wrists and his ankles, the spear thrust through his side, There on the cross, he suffered and died. And Jesus said this about his work. I came that they might have life and have it to the fullest. Listen, Jesus didn't just die that we might spend eternity in heaven with God one day. Jesus died on the cross that we could begin experiencing the abundant life today, that we could participate in this divine life in the here and now, walking and talking and knowing God and participating with God in his purposes. Can you imagine how it must have felt for Esther to look back at her life and know that all that she had been through, that God was working in every single moment to lead her to a place where she could participate in the redemption of her people. You want to know what your purpose is? So that you might know God and that you might participate in his purposes in your life. 
But here's what that often takes. Giving up the comfort of our palace. Surrendering our lives to God. Offering ourselves in service to the Lord. And that's not easy because our palaces might look a little different. Maybe for you, your palace is kind of control, right? And in your world, the little kingdom that you live in, your family, you're controlling all the stuff. I mean, the kids, are they're eating all the right things. It's, it's gluten-free. It's organic because we're trying to control things, right? We want to keep ourselves safe. Or maybe for you, your palace is financial uh, stability. And so you're like piling money back in case something's happened. That's going to keep me safe. Now, I, don't, I don't know what it looks like in your life. But we do this. We build our little palaces and things that we trust in. But when it all comes down, you know the only one who's worthy of our trust? It's God. He's the only one who protects and secures and keeps us safe. He's the only one that we can trust in. And so the invitation of Jesus Christ is to surrender your whole life to him. God, here's my money. God, here's the control I thought I had. Here's my security. Here's my plans that I had for my life. Here are my possessions. Here's all that I had. Now, God, would you take that and use it for your glory and your purposes? And if you do that, you will one day look back, and I promise you, you won't regret one thing you gave up in order that you might know God and you might serve his plans for your life. So today, the invitation is just one thing. It's that you would surrender your life to God. Holy, fully, and in every way. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the story of Esther. God, has told to us in the scriptures that demonstrate your work in seemingly insignificant circumstances. God, that you're with us through both the miraculous and the mundane, the, the tragedy and the triumph. Father, we, we're grateful that we look to your scriptures and we see who you are as God, that you're a God that can be trusted, that you're a God whose plans aren't derailed by our sin, that you're a God who's sovereign and accomplishes your purposes even in the midst of our own failures. God, we see that you're a God who's inviting us to trust you, not with just a little piece of our lives, our salvation one day, but God, you're inviting us to trust you with our whole life today. You've promised that that life is the fullest, the richest, most abundant life that we could possibly live. So, Lord, for everyone here today, myself included, I pray that we surrender our entire lives to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.